End zone. Got Dell again. His third of the night. This guy is a touchdown machine for the Houston Cougars. Sasser again just kind of taking it over right now. That's NBA stuff right there. He is a baller. Stick it in your pipe and smoke it, baby. Yes! Welcome to the Scott Hall Podcast special summer head coach interview episode edition. If you are a patron, you're getting to listen to this. 48 hours early, we hope you enjoy it, but we hope no matter whether you're a patron of the show, whether you are just somebody who listens week in, week out on the free feed, we appreciate every single one of you that tunes in to the Scott Holm Podcast. We are very excited today to talk to Houston Cougar Baseball head coach Todd Winning about everything going on in that program, past, present, future. I, I really enjoyed, I would say without spoiling the interview, the willingness of Coach Wayne to answer any and every question that we had, I think. The reason why we're so partial to Coach Whitting, the reason why we're willing to be so patient with Coach Whitting in in a lot of respects is that this is a guy who very clearly loves this university and this baseball program. So we know what it means to him. We know also the program hasn't had necessarily the best, uh, I I would say, seasons, even if we've seen some, I I think, pretty solid improvement. The last two seasons, I think everyone would agree, all parties, that not exactly what his program wants to be, but excited to see what they can do in the Big 12, excited to see the future of this team and excited to get another head coach on this show. I I think we've been very humbled about the amount of places we've been able to go and and ask questions. And I think you'll enjoy this as much as we enjoy doing it. Of course, got to mention here at the top, please, please, please support our good friends at the good brand home field apparel, homefieldapparel.com. If you were hearing this on the June 27th, the June 27th only, uh, enjoy the home field mystery boxes. Dustin and I are both previous mystery box customers enjoy that very much but if you'd like to take the mystery out if you'd like to just purchase some of home field's incredible houston cougar wearables or one of a couple hundred of other schools that home field has go to homefieldapparel.com use the promo code holman12 h-o-l-m-a-n-1-2 that will save 15 percent off your first order of incredibly comfortable incredibly unique cool vintage t-shirts including a great houston cougar collection of course support our network partners at the 1012 podcast as well uh, we are going to be 24 hours from now and perhaps 24 hours after you hear this uh, on a live podcast with representatives from the other three incoming big 12 schools as we are literally days away from houston cougar athletics being a part of the big 12 conference something i know uh, we are all very excited about here but uh, without further ado we'll not uh, wait you wait any longer here are dustin and i doing an interview that we have uh, wanted to do here for a good long while so give it a listen all right we are very excited to be joined on the scott and Hunt podcast by a repeat guest now head coach of the university of houston baseball program for uh quite some number of years now uh todd winning coach thanks so much for uh, taking some time out of your day to chat with us absolutely thanks for having me on you guys do a tremendous job so i'm excited to be back in all right. So, uh, you know, coming off of kind of a strange season here, you know, on the one hand, team missed the NCAA postseason, which is certainly always the goal. On the other hand, you did something that had never been done in program history before. You won every conference series and you had a team down the stretch that was, I think, really fun to watch and, and really easy to root for. So, you know, with kind of the dichotomy there of the things that went well, the things that didn't, you know, what are your kind of overall feelings about how the season went? Yeah, it's it's kind of bizarre. And, I, you know, I've told a lot of folks, really the last two years, the two teams, and I've loved every team that I've ever had here. They're all, we've had tremendous kids and players, and I think we have four of those guys in the big leagues right now. But probably as much fun as I've had with the group of the last two years as far as being coachable, um, the work ethic, you saw the way they played. I mean, the the, the core, you know, it's the same core group the last two years, but, you know, the the energy and enthusiasm that they play with, it makes it fun to go to work every day. And, uh you're right. We did. We fin- I think we finished 33 and 11 down the stretch. You had to check my numbers on that. But, you know, after a tough start, but you're, it, you know, you look at it, it's, it's amazing how I get so many pats on the back and cr- congratulations on a great year. But you're right. The, the ultimate goal, um, is to be in this league tournament. And I think that'll happen for us again here soon, especially going to the big 12. But, you know, we won every conference series, won 17 conference games. Um, we literally did everything we could down the stretch and our RPI never got out of the seven. I don't think it ever got into the seventies. I don't keep a close, close eye on it, but you know, we never were with it. Even when we win the conference, we weren't, if we didn't win the tournament, we were not getting that large bid. And 
you know, the American before before COVID was, and I've got all these numbers. I've done all this, the, the research on it. Before COVID, it was a top five league every year the American um, was in existence. And then since then, I haven't looked to see what it is now, but I've got, it's not, you know, it's not even close to that anymore. You know, when you're, when you sweep, we swept a weekend series this year and we dropped six or eight points in the RPI, you know, that's, that's tough. And uh, we literally, I've had, I had a, uh, Warren Nolan sent me the numbers. You know, we literally – our non-con schedule was fine. We had Cal, who's typically a good team off the West Coast, at Oklahoma A&M. You know, at, at Whataburger, that tournament, Oregon State was actually supposed to be in that tournament. They backed out late. Um, you know, and you, you're going to play some – you know, you, you, our schedule is really no difference ever been. The difference is our league. And uh, we literally would have had to win, I thought, uh, 46 games. We would had to win 46 regular season games this year to get just right at 40 or just inside 40 in the RPI, 46 games. And the, the school record's 48. <laughs> and that's, that's playing through into all the way into a super regional. So, you know, mathematically, you know, and, and I love the American conference is a great league for us. So I think we've got five or six championships out of there. Um, our league was kind of a hindrance. We literally are, were a one bid league unless you're East Carolina, who's, you know, where we were back in, you know, 17, 15, 16, 17, 18, back in there. But their RPI suffered. They should have hosted. You know, the, the league winner of this league should host, had always hosted. And they didn't have a shot because their RPI kind of kept falling down as well. So, you know, had we got out to a little better start, you know, and the same, the same can be said for 22. That year we would have had to win 45 games day in regular season to get even close to, an, to being on the bubble. And don't forget, in 19, we were number 40 in the RPI and got left out. So that doesn't guarantee – that doesn't even guarantee we would have been in. So, you know, the Big 12 will take care of that. We know that. It's a great league, and everybody is excited um, to get into that league. But I really feel like, you know, these last two years were definitely regional teams. Now, the injuries to the pitching staff, I mean, that how this club overcame that is amazing to me. You know, we go 5-11, and 11, I think, to start the season – um, that's kind of right when the wheels started falling off with the pitching. The offense was having a little trouble getting started. You knew we were going to hit because we did the year before in such a talented group of kids. But, you know, Lock Alameda goes out the second weekend. You know, Egan, who was supposed to be a big part of it, was never right all year with some elbow situation. You know, Phelps, the night he went down, was 97 against Prairie View. Um, I mean, that's the best he's ever thrown. He was going to be a big piece in the middle. Um, you know, Jose Torriaba, who was our clo- one of our closers with Sears the end of the year before, who was our projected closer this year, you know, he never got right. He finally had surgery, had a, a kind of bicep uh, injury. Um, you know, he was going to be a big piece of it. And, uh, and of course, Paul Schmitz, the super freshman we had, you know, him going down about midway through conference play was kind of a, a big blow to us as well, especially down there late. So, you know, what they did to overcome some of that stuff was just a testament to them. Our leadership was phenomenal the last two years. So, you know, this, the future is really bright, you know, around the program. I'm ex- excited to be the head coach here. I'm excited about this program as I really, literally have ever been. One of the players who made this a really fun team to watch this past season uh, was Justin Murray. He had an unbelievable season as a two-way guy. Uh, between your time as an assistant uh, here at U of H, as the head coach at U of H, you've mm-hmm. gotten to see some really remarkable two-way guys. How does Justin Murray stack up to you? Jesse Crane-like, to be honest with you. I mean, he's – you look at Jesse – and I don't remember his offensive numbers, but I know Jesse did not give up an earned run until the third game of a super regional. It was, it was insane. And, and Murray, I think offensive was better at higher average. Uh, I had to go back and look, but you know, Jesse played shortstop every day, hit over 300. I think he almost hit, he hit almost 10 homers, you know, didn't make many errors. He, literally, I thought was the best player I'd ever coached, including my time at TCU. Along comes Justin Murray and his duplicates are even better, you know, and, uh, you know, he wasn't even, you know, we knew at Dartmouth he pitched a little bit, but he wasn't like going to be one of our main guys on the mound. I said going the season that this is the most inexperienced pitching staff I've ever had, but it's the deepest pitching staff I've ever had, and it had the best stuff of any pitching staff I've ever had. And I'll I'll still stand by that. Now, when five of those top eight go down, yeah, you got to start digging a little bit, and you, you gotta, you're going to have some lopsided games to where you got to throw guys in that usually wouldn't pitch just to save what you got, but. Murray was incredible. I mean, he, it was almost a lockdown. It, the game was over when he came in off first base and, you know, hitting what he hit 379 with 11 homers, you know, still 20 out of 29 bags. That's pretty good. That's a, I'll take a Justin Murray every year. And I think he ended up, he ended up being an all American force as well. 
Yeah, so one of the things that you kind of alluded to a little bit earlier that's been really exciting about Cougar baseball in 2023 has been seeing some alumni of the program, guys like Corey Jokes and Connor Wong, really start to establish themselves as major leaguers. So what's that been like for you, and how important is it to the program to, to see guys like that carrying the, the University of Houston flag into Major League Baseball? It's awesome, especially with Corey being the hometown team. I mean, that's yeah. really special. You know, I don't, you know, and, and I'm proud of Wong. You know, Wong is up. John King is up with the Rangers. Um, Austin Pruitt's still up with the Oakland A's. So I think the most we've ever had up at one time might be five. And we've got four up there right now. And Robert, you know, Fletcher just had it. You know, Fletcher was up last year. He had arm surgery. He'll be back hopefully next year. Um, you got Robert Gaster sitting right there in the wings. He's going to be up there soon. Jared Triolo is not far away, you know, and some others that are, you know, Literally, uh, Jake Shiner was flown to Houston last year when the White Sox were here to be activated and they didn't activate him. They didn't, uh, somebody was supposed to go on the DL or something. Um, but he was that close, you know, and, uh, you know, Shiner is going to be up there pretty soon. So it's, uh, you know, so there's great representation in pro ball right now, especially on the major league level. And those guys are all doing really, really well. So you made a hire recently bringing in pitching coach Sean Kenny, most recently yeah. held the same position, uh, at the University of Georgia. His tenure at Georgia. He had some good years, had a pretty distinctive first and second half, had some really impressive pitching staffs early on, did have some struggles the past couple seasons. Mm-hmm. Part of It was part of a staff that got let go there. And, of course, even very good coaches get let go. Sure. Um, and I would just say, if nothing else, it's probably less popular with the average fan. To hire someone has been let go, regardless of the merits of the hire. So as someone who's obviously more in the know than us, more in the know certainly than the average fan, what stood out to you about Sean Kenny? What made him the right man for this position? Well, I think if you look at track record, um, you know, you can't – in SEC especially, you can't go off one or two. I mean, you can get buried in that league with a couple of injuries in a hurry. Um, you know, and with Sean, you know, I kind of went about this search a little bit different. I went I went, I went, went a different route on people that I went to um, as far as advice on who to sign. And, you know, one person that I trusted really well um, – you know, automatically said this. And once I started doing my research on him, they were right. And I mean, I can tell you this when the day that I heard Sean Kenny, Jay Johnson from LSU sent me a text and he said, you just knocked it out of the ballpark with that hire. That was a great hire. Um, you know, his pitching coach, who I, is, who I leaned really heavily on with his recommendation, Wes Johnson just took the Georgia job. And this was before Wes had the job. And he told me, he said, Sean Kenny's your guy. And if you go back and look at his track record, I think I looked it up over the night. Like you have to do my math check here, but over the nineteen last nineteen years seasons, he's had eleven staffs pitch under a four. That's pretty good. Um, you know, those are some pretty solid numbers, especially for the league that he's been in. And you know, Eric Backich um, is who he worked for at Michigan and Maryland, who's now the head coach at Clemson. Um, you know, Eric is one of the, the best head coaches in college baseball right now. And, and what he did at Michigan and Maryland, you know, with two programs that really had never no track record of success in baseball, you know, Sean was on those staffs um, when they were really clicking along and doing really at the height of what they were doing. Now, he wasn't on that that national runner up team. He'd already gone to Georgia by then, um, but he was part of those staffs. And then, you know, prior to that, he was at Pepperdine with Steve Rodriguez, who's the former Baylor coach. Um, he was his pitching guy there. And before that, San Diego. And I felt. I feel like it was important going to the Big 12 that you have somebody, you know, I wanted an SEC pitching coach, somebody that's been through the ultimate pressure cooker of college baseball, um, which is the SEC, and that's what we got in Sean Kinney. That I don't want – I don't, you know, there, there were a lot of tremendous mid-major candidates and guys that were really good and are going to be great pitching coaches, but for us, where we're at, I needed somebody going to the Big 12 who's who's kind of been there and done it. And, you know, that, that staff did get let go. I'm obviously aware of that, but people seem to forget too that I hired Frank Anderson about a week after he got fired at Oklahoma State. <laughs> you know, and it it's worked out. It worked out pretty good with Frank. So, uh, you know, it's uh, you know, I I, I think he's going to be really good. He, he he brings a great mix of you know pitching coach plus the analytics side of it, which has become really important. Um, you know, we've invested thousands and thousands of dollars in the analytics side of our to be analytically ready. Um, when recruits come in to get guys better, we're about to invest a lot more. Um, and he's very versed in, you know, those analytics and how to utilize those. Um, so I couldn't be more excited. You know, it's, uh, you know, he, he, he's exactly what I think we were looking for, um, you know, on the pitching side of the ball. 
You mentioned Frank Anderson, and it, it does seem a little bit like, you know, to be blunt, maybe since he, he hasn't been here, that the, the pitching hasn't been quite to the standard at the University of Houston that it was during his tenure. Certainly mm-hmm. the control aspect seems, you know, and certainly injuries, I think, are, like you mentioned, are part of that as well. Right, but the control right. aspect, you know, this past season, U of H surrendering almost six and a half, you know, walks and hit by pitches per uh, per nine innings. So, you know, is, is fixing that more of a, is it a getting guys healthy question? Is it more of a recruiting question? Is it more of a coaching question? And, and you know, was the Sean Kenny hire made with kind of the, how, how big of a priority was finding someone who could come in and, and kind of clean up the control issues? I think all of the above. You know, I think uh, obviously with your five year top eight guys going down, you're going to dip a little bit, but you know, you got to pitch better than a six and a half. And we've been around six for two years. So, um, you know, injuries are some of it. And there's no doubt about that. I'm not, you can't, you know, nobody cares to hear about that, but it's reality. Um, obviously, I think, you know, managing that staff a little better, I think. With Coach Kenny, I'm going to give him more support. You know, it's it was it's always basically been a pitching coach and 20, 22, 24 pitchers by himself. So I'm going to hire some sub staff, you know, some some support staff for him. You know, that can help him with the analytic data, can help him with the pregame prep. You know, things that they can legally do, not as coaches, but in the in the, off to the side to help him prepare that staff a little bit better for Big Twelve play. But you know, it's uh, you know, we we pitched pretty good in 18 after the year after Frank left. You know, in 19, if you look at 19. We should have been in the regional that year. You know, we were the first team out of the 64. Um, our RPI was around 40. We got jumped by TCU at 52, and I think Florida State at 57. So, you know, that one that was that was a tough. I don't that doesn't happen going forward in the Big 12. Those kind of things won't happen again to us. But that was also a really good team that pitched pretty well in a Rooney. And then 2021, you got COVID. Um, you know, and to me, those years were just a, those were a disaster. You know, 20 didn't start out great, but we had a bunch of guys hurt then. And uh, in 21, we all know how that one went. That was that was just crazy. How that our league just cannibalized itself. That you're playing so many league games. Um, you know, it was crazy. But you know, 20, we got to pitch 22, 23. You're right. We didn't pitch well, and I'm fully aware of that. And that's why I'm happy to have Coach Kenny come on board. What needs to happen to get this team back to being a regular regional program every year? Like we've talked about, obviously there are uncontrollable variables there, but. What do you think, you know, and obviously the league is going to help too, but what do you think this program needs to do to get back to being a regional team more years than not? Well, I think if you look at most mid-major programs, the great ones over the years, which I never really considered as mid-major, but everybody else does. So I'll I'll throw that term out there because I've always, I've never thought of the AAC as a mid-major conference. But if you look at those teams, Rice, you know, they have the uptick and downtick. Cal State Fullerton, uptick, downtick. East, uh, East Carolina, I mean, there was a point that at one time we had beaten East Carolina 10 times in a row. Um, you know, and Cliff's one has a tremendous program over there. Coastal Carolina, up to down. You see them you ebb and flow. It's hard to maintain that consistency because the, the, there's no room for error when it comes to RPI. You know, you're, you're, you've got to win a bunch of games. You have to be a, a no doubter for an at large. The year we got left out in 19, I think there were five at large bids for non power five schools. Five. Okay, and I think this year it was four, maybe five. You have to go back and look, but four, maybe five at large bids for non-power five schools. I mean, you're really planning to be. You got to beat out how many other schools in the country to be one of those people. That, I mean, if you look at it, it, it kind of the, the math does not stack up not being a power five league, and that's where yeah, you know, I know the expectation level. But look at Central Florida's had great teams over the years. And since Lovely has been there, they've only been one time, and he's won thirty five, thirty six, thirty seven games almost every year that he's been there. So that, you know, but you look at those schools, you know, like I said, Cal State Fullerton and some of the other ones that have, you know, been, you know, the non-Power 5 schools, it's hard for them to maintain that trajectory over a course of that many years um, because the, 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 there's such a small margin of error when it comes to, to getting those bids, unless you just win the tournament. And we all know how hard that is to do. Yeah, so I wanted to talk to you, just kind of circle back to something you mentioned earlier, which was your your non-conference uh, scheduling philosophy. And, and I'm kind of curious how that changes as you're going to the Big 12, because you mentioned with, you know, even even getting some of the some of the tougher teams on the non-conference schedule, the overall strength of schedule numbers just aren't there with the conference being what it is. So, you know, obviously, you know, I, I think a lot of fans, it's easy to just be like, well, why don't you just schedule that team? Why don't you just schedule that team? And, you know, of course, you can't force anybody to play you that uh, doesn't want to. But so I guess I'm kind of yeah. curious, what, what does your ideal non-conference schedule look like? And, and how, if at all, is that changing as you head into a, uh, a tougher conference? Well, I think you schedule, you schedule as many, so a few games you know you're going to win, okay? A few games that, are bonuses if you win them that are against really good top 25 type teams. And then you fall somewhere in the middle. We had number one strength of schedule. I can't remember what year it was years ago. And if you looked at the schedule, you're like, this really wasn't that tough a schedule, but you're all, it's all relative to how the teams you schedule play. Right. 
Um, and that year it was a bunch of schools. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a, an extremely tough schedule. I, I didn't think because in the American back then you didn't have to schedule, you didn't, you didn't have to schedule yourself out into a bunch of losses because the league was so good. If you went 33 and 11, like we did and won 17 conference games before COVID but in back before 2019, you're, you're hosting a regional. You're literally hosting a regional. Now it's not the way because the league couldn't, our league RPI, it would not, league would not allow us to jump up a little bit. So, you know, Going into, you know, you look at Cal. I mean, you're all at the, at the mercy of it. Cal should have been a higher RPI team than they were. We had Oklahoma on there. We had Texas A&M on there. Um, Minnesota and Northwestern, you know, didn't have very good years. Those are typically decent RP, RPI wins because they play so many games on the road. They kind of have inflated RPIs in the north a little bit, right? So, you look at those things. Corpus, you know, that was a good, that was a good solid tournament for us. Oregon, I got into that tournament actually because Oregon State was supposed to be in it. Um, they backed out. That's when they put Incarnate Word in the tournament. So, you know, those are the kind of variables behind the scenes that people really don't see. Going to the Big 12, yeah, I mean, you didn't change your schedule and philosophy a lot. You're going to catch all your RPI in conference play, you know. And for us next year, we're going to reopen the third. We got, we got Binghamton the first weekend. We got St. John's the second weekend. Then we're at Minute Maid the third weekend. And then, boom, we're riding the Big 12 play after that. And we have a – I mean, I can't talk about Big 12 schedule yet. They don't allow us to, but – um you know, that then it gets really, you know, we're going to go from 24 American Athletic Conference games to 30 Big 12 games. Um, so it's going to be exciting. It's going to be fun. And there's, there's plenty of RPI to get, to get there for sure. So, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be a great league. It's going to be a lot of fun for us. We've talked to a number of UH head coaches about the move to the Big 12. And mm-hmm. while it means different things for different coaches and different sports, I think one very common refrain we've heard is, is coaches saying that there's just this whole other pool of talented recruits who would categorically rule U of H out when this was an American program who are now suddenly interested with the program. Now that the big 12 move is really on the horizon here, what differences are fans going to see going forward with your recruiting classes as you are now recruiting to a conference like the big 12? Yeah, it's whole, it's whole different conversations. And it'll start with, this is the best group of high school, Houston area, high school kids, um, that we've ever signed. And, you know, it'd be, a lot of that's due to the Big 12. You know, they want to stay home. We're not now another Big 12 option for them. Um, so it, it basically gets you in conversations that never before. I mean, honestly, we, I probably finished second to more recruits than anybody in the country <laughs> because at the end of the day, they love U of H. They love the staff. They love the facility, but they want to go play in the Power Five. And that's what the decision comes down to a lot. Now that's no longer an excuse, but, um, the high school class coming in, like I said, I'm extremely excited about, you know, Connor Bennett, you know, the, the, the Tristan Russell, uh, Drake, uh, Alex Elise out of South Texas, the Ochoa kid who will probably lose to the draft on uh, the east side of town. Um, you know, there's some, there's some really good, solid high school players in there. And, you know, along with some Juco guys that we're bringing in and, and obviously what we do in the portal this summer, um, you know, will be really good. And, you know, that it's, it's one thing too. You know, with our roster, everybody always says, well, why don't you just recruit Houston? You can win a national championship in Houston. Well, you, you 100% can, but everybody else in the country thinks the same thing. And, uh, you know, they, and we have some scholarship advantages. If you look at our, our junior college kids, um, and transfers from out of state, we have some, some, there's an academic awards that they're eligible for that in state kids aren't. Um, so it's, you know, when, when people are like, why do we have so many out of state kids? Well, because it's, it's, I'm dealing with the salary cap, right? And we have 11.7. And the, the better I can stretch that 11.7 through, you know, academic awards and things like that, you know, it only helps get the program deeper. And, uh, you know, th- that's when you can get guys like Robert Gass or Jake Shiner and some of those other kids who've been and, – and there's so many more great players um, that we've had, um, you know, basically because, you know, it helps me deal with the salary cap a little more, a little more economically. All right. So, Coach, I appreciate, really appreciate your time. I do want to ask you one more question before you go about the impending move to the Big 12 and kind of uh, the, the upcoming season here uh, in 2024 for you. And it's just, um, you know, I, I think it's something that in, you know, as you know, Sam and I are definitely fans of every U of H sport. I think we're going to kind of find over and over again throughout the next coming, you know, athletic season is just like, oh, yeah, it's you're not you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you're not prepared for as you head to the right. Big 12. So, you know, how do you kind of set expectations or is it even possible to set expectations for what you think the program, you know, can and should achieve in, in year one in a, a much tougher conference? Well, it's it's going to be challenging, that's for sure. You know, and, you know, we we're you know, we've always been in the business of trying to build teams to go to Omaha and not compete in conferences, you know, and hopefully we're building that type of program, that type of team for next year. Um, that will perform well in the Big 12. You know, the the ultimate goal is never, 
to win the Big 12. That's a great byproduct. The ultimate goal is to be playing, you know, be playing last night like LSU and in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, Florida were. So, you know, or be in that party at the end. But it's a uh, that's a hard place to get to, obviously. But it's, it's uh, but it's something that's feasible here, especially with us going to the Big 12. I think we'll have more opportunities in NCAA play. Um, and we, you know, I don't want to take anything away from the kids that we've signed here in the past. We've had tremendous players in the past. We've had four first round draft picks and a bunch of, uh, a whole bunch of kids make the big leagues and, and they were just great college players, but it has allowed us to get into some homes that uh, we weren't able to before. But it, it's hard to say, you know, where we stack up, you know, because you don't, with the portal, you don't even know who's on anybody's team anymore. <laughs> I mean, honestly, you do, like we got to conference with American this year, right? you know, you got to start going through preseason all conference stuff. I remember that. And I'm like, well, I don't even know if some of these guys are even back, um, you know, that were such good players in our league before. So that's a whole other dynamic that's been thrown into us is, is the portal and NIL and all those things. But uh, it'll be fun. It'll be enjoyable. It'll be, it'll be great. To, you know, I played the Southwest Conference, you know, when I was at Houston, so those those rivalries are going to be fun to get those things where they really mean something again, um, like they did in the past. Yeah, so we're looking forward to those rivalries. And as someone who's been to, to Omaha as a fan, definitely hope, you know, one of my sports bucket lists is seeing uh, U of H there, uh, and I know it is for you too. So looking to see the program uh, hopefully building towards that. But uh, best of luck for the coming season, Coach. And uh, just thanks again for, for taking your time out today to talk to us. All right, guys, anytime. Let me know. And that's it for this podcast. Hope you enjoyed the interview. Hope you enjoyed Dustin and I chatting with Todd Whitting. Hope you're enjoying what we've been putting out there this summer. Not just the interviews with Coach Whitting and Coach Holgerson, but the summer pod talk series with some of our soon-to-be new Big 12 friends and as well as checking back in with some of our good longtime guest friends from the American Conference. I, I know Dustin and I have enjoyed putting that together, giving you some weekly content here over this, I guess, a little bit more fallow summer months. We've got some stuff coming on the premium feed as well. We're going to do a year in review. Bobby and I uh, uh, excited about that, uh, as well as, obviously, a recap of, I think, a pretty newsy past couple weeks, and Dustin and I doing a uh, a little program-wide review of uh, Houston Cougar Athletics, kind of a follow-up on what we did last summer that uh, we are excited for you to hear as well once Dustin is back for vacation. So uh, please don't hesitate to get in contact with us, shpawdcast at gmail.com. Tell us what you like. Tell us what you'd like to see us do. Tell us what you don't like. Really, just any kind of feedback. And of course, please, please, please give us a five-star review wherever you listen to podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, etc. I know if you listen to podcasts, everybody says, give us a five-star review. It's easy to kind of just tune that out, but I promise you that giving us a five-star review helps us reach more potential Cougar listeners and uh, just a little free something you could do to support our show. Of course, we're big Twitter degenerates. You can hit us at SHPAWDCast on Twitter as long as that site exists. But I think that's it for us uh, today. I think that's it for this interview and this episode. We hope you're having a good summer. Uh, Enjoy what you heard. And uh, as always, go Cougs. Go Cougs. Vamos los Cougs. Go Cougs. Go Cougs. Go Cougs. We had to kick the door and no cap. 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 No cap.